Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. James Brooks, and I'm pleased to serve as the Melanie Trent de Shutter Library Director here at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And it's really wonderful to see so many of you here today. The VMHC acknowledges the Powhatan Confederacy and the Monacan Nation that inhabited the land where the museum now stands. We seek to honor that history and to maintain thoughtful relationships with those indigenous peoples and all the tribes of Virginia. Their story is integral to Virginia's past, its present, and its future. We also wish to acknowledge the generosity of former trustee Anne Worrell, who endowed this lecture series in honor of our former president and CEO, Dr. Charles Bryan. So before we uh, begin today's program, I'd like to make you aware of several events uh, that we have coming up over the next month. Um, next Tuesday on April 11th at 1 p.m., please join us for an in-person talk on the Browns Island explosion by historian and MPS ranger Bert Dunkley. Bert is going to talk about the explosion, which was the worst home front disaster in the Confederacy in March of 1863. And the program will feature a special opportunity to see rare items from our collections relating to the incident. And this event is free to both members um, and the wider public. On Wednesday, the 19th of April at 5.30, please join us for our Stuart J., uh, G. Christian lecture, One Giant Leap by New York Times bestselling author, Charles Fishman. Charles is gonna be here to explain the Herculean effort that saw the United States accomplish an almost impossible mission to fly humanity to the moon. Of course, this special event ties in with a recent exhibition that we've just opened and that I'm sure many of you have already seen. If you haven't had the opportunity to see that lecture, please do so and please encourage all of your friends and family to attend. Back to Earth for our final um, update about next, next events. For our next in-person noontime lecture, um, we'll have Chris Graham here speaking about his new book, Confessions of a Southern Church. Graham's newly published book traces how in 2015, the rector at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Richmond urged a, um, a reintegration an interrogation of the church's former identity as the so-called Church of the Confederacy. This was following the murder of worshippers by a white man enamored with Confederate iconography at the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Chris is going to be here to speak to us on April 27th at the usual time of 12 noon. So now to today's program. Today's lecture explores David O's David O. Stewart's uh, most recent publication, The Burning Land, a work of historic fiction inspired by one of David's own ancestors and his long and tragic service in the 20th Maine Infantry in the American Civil War, of course. The book allows David to explore how war changes soldiers, those closest to them and their, their home communities. These men face their own mortality and that of others, they endured the strict regimentation of army life and an almost constant absence from family and friends. David O. Stewart turned to writing after a successful career practicing law in Washington, D.C., and he is the national best-selling author and award, uh, national best-selling and award-winning author, mind you, of several previous nonfiction books on American history, including Madison's Gift, Five Partnerships That Built America, and George Washington, The Political Rise of America's Founding Father. David has also written several other works of historical fiction, including the Fraser and Cook Mysteries and the Overstreet Saga, the second of which in the trilogy is the subject of today's lecture. Please join me in giving David a very warm welcome. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you all for coming here. Um, I'll try not to be rattled even though driving down on I-95 was the adventure that it usually is. <laughs> I have such respect for you people having to deal with that and I hope you don't actually very often. Um, what I hope to do today is to provide a little bit of a 
view of the interaction between history and imagination when you are doing historical fiction as I have done along with what I call straight history with no sexual connotations. Um, and this uh, book grew out of um, my fascination with my family's stories. I think historians always have that draw. Um, and it, it, I have very different heritage. Um, my grandparents on my father's side were Jews from Eastern Europe. My mother had mostly Irish ancestors, um, came over in the late 19th century, very difficult to trace because the key guy was William O'Brien. And if you're trying to find William O'Brien in Ellis Island, there's a, an abundance of opportunity. Um, but one strand of her family arrived in the 1750s. So they were here for most of American history and they had blessedly an unusual name so I could trace them. They, they were findable, not because they were eminent, but because they were unusual. Um, and she told stories about them. And I just have discovered in my later years that they were sometimes true. Um, now, the one I'm going to talk about today uh, is The Burning Land. It's set in the Civil War, as John mentioned, uh, and the Westward Migration, and just released two days ago on Tuesday. As a friend of mine, another author, described it. Uh, your release date is sort of the calm before the calm. Um, <laughs> the book comes out and everything's the same. Um, book one... Uh, which came out a little more than a year ago. It was called The New Land, and that is the immigration story, the people who landed on the coast of Maine in the 1750s, and uh, it carries them through the Revolutionary War. They were, they were German immigrants. And then book three, which will come out early next year, is called The Resolute Land, and it is the World War II generation, actually my mother's generation. Uh, so that trajectory has focused me on a couple of subjects for today. One is I'm having the chance with these books to do what you might call regular people history. Now, these are not my ancestors, but they're regular people. And, you know, I've written books on Madison and Washington, and the framers of the Constitution, and they're fascinating and they're great stories. But there's also the stories about the rest of us and they're just making their way and scuffling. And I found that, I find that a very interesting way to look at history. The male protagonist in The Burning Land, Henry Overstreet, is a ship joiner. That's a 19th century term for a carpenter uh, building ships. And he's still in the same town on the coast of Maine where his ancestors had landed in the 1750s. The woman he falls in love with Katie Nash wants to teach school. They end up running a butcher shop and then a laundry. So these are prosaic lives, but they're also special lives as all are. And just as much as George Washington, who aimed high in the world and charted, charted his path accordingly, these people had to look at the opportunities that were there the roads they might take, choose their goals, and figure out how to reach what they, how to do what they wanted to do. And of course, they were influenced by historical events. And those events will disrupt the lives of regular people and sometimes open up their lives. They'll find new horizons because of them. And in order to write convincing stories about ordinary lives, I need to understand the times that framed those people. So in the 1860s, these characters were free, not free only to figure out what they wanted to do in the world because there was this giant war. Uh, and it's the Civil War is in many ways still with us so many generations later. Uh, and it struck me as I was preparing this talk that my three books deal with, these three novels deal with the three wars that really consumed every American 
the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and World War II. Now, we've had other conflicts, and they've been terrible in their own way, and the people who were swept up in them had their lives turned upside down the way war does. But these three wars changed every American's daily life. And just to take a couple of numbers for the Civil War to illustrate that, um, there were 35 million Americans in the 1860s. 2.6 million served in the Union Army. Another million served in the Confederate Army. So that meant 10% of the population was in uniform. Everybody knew somebody who was serving in the war. Most were related to somebody who was serving in the war. A comparable number today would be 35 million Americans in uniform. It's unimaginable. So it was an all-consuming experience from top to bottom of the country. So because the this people in it start out up in Maine, the question arises, well, there, there's this sort of myth that the Northerners were all joined together in the Union cause. Uh, it's a myth, it's not true, and particularly not in this case. Um, these people came from this little town on the main coast, it's called Waldeboro. You can see it's quite small now, it used to be bigger. And all of those, the shoreline there used to be shipyards because they, at one point it was the fifth largest shipbuilding uh, city in America. Um, and they didn't build the big ships, those were built in Philadelphia and New York. So they built the middle-sized and smaller ships which were involved in the coastal trade and their customers were cotton merchants. That's what the major trade was before the Civil War. And they were facing a situation where they were going to war against their customers. And a lot of them didn't think that was a very good idea. And in fact, Waldeboro voted against Lincoln all the time. And they did not want to go to this war. Now, for those families who had men in the, in the Union Army, that's pretty un, un, inconvenient. When your loved, loved one is out risking his life, you're not much interested in hearing about why the war is a bad idea. It creates bitter feelings and bitter bitterness that can linger. Now, the other thing, of course, that war always brings on the home front is hardship. Those who are left behind become poorer. Um, armies take away many of the able-bodied people in the community there's still the same amount of work to be done, but there are fewer hands to get it done. And during the Civil War years, as it always is true during war, the extra burden falls on women. And not because they had so much time to fill, but because they were the ones who were still there. I recently read a study of Ireland in the 1950s. This will turn out to be relevant. Um, at a time when most homes in Ireland did not have piped in water. It was sort of amazing to read that. And they did a study of how much time the women of a household spent carrying water. Because of course that was a woman's job. And the answer was more than 30 hours a week. Well, think of all the things you use water for, you know, prepare food, wash yourself, wash your clothes, wash your house. If you have a garden, I mean, you need water. And it's just, if you're spending 30 hours a week on that, it doesn't leave a lot of time for everything else. Now also food and goods become more expensive. Hunger will spread across the land. 
During the Civil War, it was worth, worse in the South than in the North, but it struck everywhere. And that sort of deprivation leaves lasting impressions. Now, another development in the Civil War is that quite a few women chose to become nurses and to follow the troops to try to help. Some 40,000 women served as nurses during the war. And this both was a tremendous contribution, of course, in a traditional female role on an industrial scale. It siphoned off more of the able-bodied who were not available at home, but it also widened the, those women's view of their own roles. They were out of, in the world, they were out of the house they could make some changes, they could have an impact. But most of the impact directly, of course, fell on the soldiers. And we do know now, and I think we've always known, that soldiers are changed by war. The most obvious problem <laughs> is you could get killed. And combat is fierce. It was terrible in the Civil War. The diseases were also endemic through both armies. 700,000 soldiers died. That's out of the 3.5 million who served. That's 20%. Comparable losses today would be 7 million died. Now more were wounded, of course. After the war, we had 60,000 amputees in the country. Now, of the actual combat experience, which I'll talk about more in a minute, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat is, of course, the most searing. The person is right in front of you. He's trying to kill you. You have to try to kill him. It is terrifying. But an interesting thing I've discovered over the years, and I was not... I did not serve in the military, but there is a lot of study of this that shooting at people is more difficult than it looks on TV and in the movies. During World War II, the army got curious how many bullets had to be fired in order to kill one enemy. And the answer was 45,000. At Gettysburg, at the end of the battle and the people who were stuck trying to clean up the, the catastrophe that was left behind, the dead people, the dead animals, the wounded, just everything blown to bits. Um, they found 27,000 loaded muskets abandoned on the battlefield. Soldiers had just dropped them. Now there are explanations for these numbers we don't exactly know them. These aren't causations, but they're possible explanations. One is that soldiers in battle fire guns for reasons other than to kill. You may be shooting to scare the other guy and get him to run away. That's a great outcome for a soldier. Um, you may want to just appear you're fighting because you are loyal to your fellows. You don't want to be the one who's not pulling the sled but there are soldiers who don't want to kill. And that was an interesting idea for me to come upon. There's a wonderful book, wonderful in the sense of illuminating, not because it's fun, uh, by this fellow Dave Grossman, who was a trained infantry for the American army for many years. And he writes at length about how difficult it is to get many soldiers to be willing to kill. It's just natural in us to be reluctant to do that. Not everybody, unfortunately, but most people. And just a simple thing. The Army discovered that using doing target practice with bullseyes was ineffective, and that the soldiers became much more able in combat if they did target practice against cutouts of a human form, because they didn't have that flinch 
of firing against something that looked like a person. He also writes about how there are a lot of soldiers who care about the cause that they're fighting for, want it to win, and they will help their comrades who internally are able to do, engage in killing. They'll assist them with uh, weapons, they'll get them ammunition, they'll get them supplies, they'll do everything they can to help them. But they shrink from that final step. So what is the toll? What was the toll on the soldiers in the Civil War? Let me try one more statistic. Um, the chances of dying in uniform in that war you might have done this in your head as I was doing the earlier numbers, but it was one in five. Now look around the room. <laughs> one in five. Uh, that's high. In the Korean War, it was calculated that for Americans in uniform, the risk of death was one in 126. Now, many of those deaths were due to disease, as I mentioned, but a lot were due to combat. And that creates an amazing level of stress. These people were not imagining the danger they were in. So the question for me becomes, what about the 80% who came home? Now we've known that soldiers were changed ever since the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was written 4,000 years ago in the uh, Euphrates Valley, or in Homer's Iliad which was created 2,500 years ago. The, the warriors in those epics are all damaged and changed by, by war. Um, violence on the battlefield changes people. Just the other day, the Washington Post ran uh, a treatment of the Vietnam War and had a section by Carl Marlantes. You may know him. He's a fine novelist who wrote uh, Matterhorn about his service in the Vietnam War. He was a Marine officer, and he's very candid. He came home with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I found very haunting the way he described the changes on his first patrol in the jungle in Vietnam. You hear a sound. And then you think, is that a leaf falling or an animal or an enemy? By that time, you're dead. And his point was that you change, your mind changes. It changes right there and it changes hard. And it's very hard to change it back when the, the danger is somehow is, is gone. Now, we use this fancy term now, PTSD. It's defined in the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, which is in DC, DSM-5 is the shorthand. And the idea has spread through our culture. Not only war has been recognized as traumatic. Childhood abuse, family abuse, all can have the same impact. It can, it has been argued and maybe with some force that we've allowed the concept of trauma to spread to areas it doesn't belong, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. The question for me was, did Civil War soldiers exhibit PTSD? Which is a relatively new question for historians to look at. And I think the answer is, of course. Uh, there. This research has been hamstrung a bit because there were poor medical records from that era. Uh, and particularly because physicians had no vocabulary to describe the symptoms that people were having. There was no recognized science of psychiatry at the time. There was very much a tendency to label soldiers who had mental suffering from combat as malingerers cowards. Victorian culture 
require that men be strong and silent. In truth, those who are afraid, like the hero of Stephen Crane's wonderful novel, The Red Badge of Courage, tended to straggle behind when the fighting started. They were afraid and they couldn't control it. Indeed, as the war entered its third and fourth years, sometimes entire units, and this was on both sides, you get a whole company, would not go forward. The officers became desperate to find soldiers who were willing to join the battle. Now the soldiers themselves in the 1860s knew when their comrades were suffering PTSD-like symptoms. The future Supreme Court Justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., was a captain in the Union Army, served in combat, and he wrote in 1864, shortly before he resigned his commission, many a man has gone crazy since this campaign began from the terrible pressure on mind and body. Common phrases that the Civil War soldiers used to describe men with this affliction were that they were played out or broke down. I was interested in that because it anticipates the later use of the term breakdown. And there are plenty of examples of this problem. I'm going to pick on a couple, one because it's, it's so prominent and a little bit surprising, which was General James Longstreet of the Confederate Army. He was the Central Corps commander for Robert E. Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia. He was a brilliant soldier. He first saw combat in the Mexican War. He was wounded in that, in that war. And in the Civil War, he experienced the horrors of dozens of battles in Virginia and Tennessee. He viewed acres of corpses, suffering men, terrible hospital scenes. Then at the Battle of the Wilderness in May 1864, he was shot accidentally by his own troops, something else that happens in war. The bullet entered behind his shoulder burst out through the base of his throat. It was a terribly gory and bloody wound. He had to be taken off the field. It's somewhat miraculous that he survived. He required five months of recuperation afterwards. And I was struck by a phrase written by a woman who attended him during the recuperation. General Longstreet is very feeble and nervous. He sheds tears on the slightest provocation and apologizes for it. He says he does not see why a bullet going through a man's shoulder should make a baby of him. Now there you have sort of crystallized a good deal of the PTSD experience, which is you've lost control of your mind. You've lost control of your emotions to some extent, and you're ashamed, which I, I near as I can tell is pretty universal and not fair. Now, Longstreet did return to the war and he lived another 49 years. This picture I'm putting up of him later after the war because it shows he completely lost the use of his right arm. So he has it stashed in his vest just to conceal it. And he was never able again to speak above a whisper. But one of the interesting things about Longstreet was that he was the most conciliatory of the former senior Confederate generals after the war. He accepted significant positions in the federal government and was denounced by that by his former Confederate comrades as being a collaborationist. And I can't say that that was a direct connection, <coughs> pardon me, to his terrible experience, but I wonder about it. Now, Longstreet it was merely the most prominent sufferer I could find out about. Private Lewis Beckhart of Connecticut, 
was standing next to a comrade at the edge of a battlefield. His comrade wanted a drink of water. Beckhardt handed him his canteen while it was still around Beckhardt's neck. At which point, a cannonball crushed his comrade's skull, covering Beckhardt in gore. Beckhardt was never the same again. He was ultimately sent to the government hospital for the insane, which we now know as St. Elizabeth's Hospital in the District of Columbia. And his care was to keep him quiet. Sometimes they gave him opiates or whiskey, I assume to calm him down. And sometimes had him do light gardening. Now at one level, it doesn't sound terrible, but the fact is he never recovered. He never left that hospital. There was another Connecticut rat regiment that was heaved into battle after just a couple of weeks following their muster. They were poorly trained. They ended up in the Andersonville prison camp, which was a horror of its own. And more than a dozen men in that regiment ended up in government asylums or suicides. So what are the symptoms of PTSD? Uh, that you're exposed to trauma, that you relive the event, that you're estranged from others or fear the future, that you experience poor sleep, poor concentration, or exaggerated startle responses, and have impaired social skills. Now, these last couple of items might seem sort of mundane, even to describe people we know or even oneself. But the PTSD sufferers have all of them, and they have some in extreme versions. And it wasn't only the doctors who didn't have a way to describe the, what the soldiers were going through. The family members had no vocabulary, no good understanding of the changes in their brother or their husband or their son. They knew that the war had changed them and they struggled to find ways to help. They had no training to deal with those changes and often were unnerved by them. We know now that there is a form of secondhand trauma and loss that is suffered by the family of people who develop these symptoms. For the veterans themselves, they could exhibit erratic behaviors that made it difficult to find work. They could be disruptive and unreliable. Others were restless. Many took to the relatively new railroad system and wandered the country. Here's roving Bill Aspinwall, who's a Union veteran who spent 25 years riding the rails. This He wrote a memoir about it, or it's actually a bunch of letters to his, uh, his friend that the friend ended up publishing. And here's a, a memo, uh, excuse me, an image of a, uh, 1917 movie about hobos. And I had always asso associated hobos with the depression, with the 1930s. But it turns out it was the Civil War veterans who invented hobos. It was a shorthand for homeward bound. And it was just one more evil consequence of the conflict. Now with Civil War veterans, there was some stumbling early stabs at explaining what was going on with their mental and emotional impairments. Some doctors called it nostalgia. And it's not the sort of gauzy flashbacks that we get in Hollywood movies. Nostalgia was really an extreme sadness, a deep depression. We would call it today depression. Uh, a Philadelphia physician, Jacob DaCosta, noted that some veterans had what we would now call panic attacks that caused their heartbeats to race for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes at crazy levels. He focused on the symptom, not what was causing it, and he called it irritable heart 
diagnosed it in more than 100 veterans and wrote an article about it that influenced other doctors who tried to figure out what was wrong with these people's, you know, the cardiac system. Now, a British doctor studied those who were damaged in a similar way by merely seeing the carnage at railway accidents. Railway accidents were endemic in uh, the 19th century. The trains were not safe and they happened at high speed and we have accidents today. So it's not that we're holier than thou, but they had uh, real carnage. And some of the witnesses who had no injuries would develop symptoms like what we would call PTSD, headaches, fatigue, deep fears, erratic behaviors. He tried to explain that, and his theory was there was some, something in the vibrations of the, of the railway cars that disturbed nervous systems, and he called it railway spine. As time went on, in other wars, the phenomena were noticed given other names. In World War I, oh, excuse me, it was shell shock for the troops who were stuck in the trenches under artillery barrages for weeks and months. In World War II, it was called combat fatigue, battle fatigue. Now the current treatments for PTSD, and I'm just gonna paraphrase this for you, they're, they're just talk therapies. They're designed to help the person face the horror that the person doesn't want to face. And it's, there's a rationality to not wanting to face it. But the consensus is that until you do, you cannot beat some of the symptoms that are driving you and your cl close people close to you crazy. Um, I want to talk about one last consequence of Civil War service, a little less gloomy than PTSD. Um, the soldiers who were sent to serve, and this is true for North and South, left farms. They had lives that didn't involve much travel until then. And they saw large stretches of the country. They saw how big the country was and how much else was out there. And, where there might be other opportunities, other people, other worlds. My mother used to use a phrase which came from World War I, and it's the same phenomenon, how are you gonna keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? For the Civil War veterans, that meant going west to settle the Midwest and the West, both North and South, that was the solution. And Chicago and St. Louis exploded as gateways to these new lands. And, oops, and my ancestors landed in Chicago. Okay, so these are all pretty interesting, I hope. But what's a historical novelist to do with this stuff? Now, I can't give away everything about the book. That would be, my publisher would be angry. But... I wanted to talk about a few ways that in, this information influenced me. Henry, the male protagonist, served in the 20th Maine Infantry, which is a somewhat celebrated unit. And I made a few decisions about him based on what I knew about him, but also about the person he was copied from at some level, but also the experience of soldiers at the war I did want to show that not every soldier was disabled by these experiences. And here's a reunion of the 20th Maine 25 years later on the battlefield at Gettysburg. The veterans love to have these reunions. North and South, they would both be there together and, you know, have a few drinks, swap some lies. Um, but different soldiers bring different histories and predispositions to war. They have different experiences during the war and they react differently. But by the same token, the war had to change him. It does. 
I take Carl Marlantes at his word on that. It places great stress on marriages, on parenting, on friendships. I didn't want him to be leveled by it or to have him display a checklist of symptoms. Then the story would become a psychiatry text. But I didn't want to ignore it and pretend it didn't happen. And I understood that the changes had to reverberate through the family, that everyone experiences that stress, that damage. I also thought he would need to head west after the war. Of course, my ancestor did, and so many others did. But changing where he lived would not be an escape from the price that soldiers paid. As Stephen Crane wrote in The Red Badge of Courage, after his protagonist had found his courage and managed to enter the battle that he had fled from, Crane writes, and so it came to pass, as he trudged from the place of blood and wrath, his soul changed. Thank you very much. I'm happy to field any questions or comments you might have. We have one here. Oh, wherever. There were a lot of um, African-American soldiers that fought in the Civil War, and I was just wondering if you had any particular comments or insights on that as far as PTSD and community support. Uh, I haven't found any good research on them. Uh, for them, the war was much more important than for the whites on either side. And cathartic if they lived through it. Um, they really wanted to kill slavery. Uh, so it's possible that they might have suffered a bit less from PTSD, but what little I know about it, I suspect not much less. I think the actual experience of combat is so immense that your reasons for being there don't determine your response. Wouldn't any soldier uh, in a trench in World War I or any of these battles have gotten PTSD? I mean, why would one person get it in the trench and the next person would not? I, I, I think we have to accept that they're all changed but it manifests itself in different ways. And some are disabled. I mean, they become, they, they gibber, they cannot function. I mean, that's the red badge of courage. Um, many can stand it, but sometimes only for so long. So it's all different depending on who you are, what your experience have been, have been, what your situation is, how quickly you can recover for it, from it depends on your support. There is speculation that for the Civil War soldiers, many returned to supportive families and communities that, that knew them. Whereas in modern day, there's less of that network to support people. So they may have been able to come back better. Um, so, you know, there's a spectrum of responses to these stresses. And sure, there were some World War I soldiers who toughed it out for four years, but they weren't the same person after four years. Thank you. This is more of a personal question. Uh, what is your writing process? 
how do you go about getting your research and how do you put the book together? Uh, for fiction, um, I need to know where I'm going. Uh, there are people who just sit down and start to write and see where the story takes them. Uh, the famous thing people say is they their characters tell them where the story goes. And my reaction is if my characters know where the story go is going, they keep it to themselves. <laughs> um, so I need to outline it. And I may change it as I write along. And I will try to do the research before I get started. Um, so I'm not interrupting myself uh, to, to rush off and figure something out. Nonfiction is different. Um, first of all, the sequence of the story, the outline is not that, I mean, I know what's gonna happen. You know, I, George Washington had this life and we know what, where it went. Um, there I have the embarrassment of riches in terms of resources. You know, there's 75 volumes of his papers and God knows what else there is. So I can't read everything and sit down and write it. I have to study his early years and then write that and then study his middle years and then write that because I'll forget what I read two years ago when I'm trying to write it. So it, it's different. Um, there is a difference between writers, which I've discovered, which is there are those who hate to give up researching. I am not in that group. Um, and there are those who can't wait to start writing, and I am in that group. I like writing. And for nonfiction, I have to, and both, I have to force myself to wait wait until I have my ideas better worked out. Um, and when you work on a book, when I work on a book, I find I am sometimes surprised by where I go, uh, where the story goes. There was one book, I won't tell you which one, where I ended up killing off a guy that I just didn't think I was gonna. Um, but it, it, it felt right, it still does. So, um, you know, it is, the creative process, there is imagination involved. Um, and even in nonfiction, there is imagination involved in how you organize things and the connections you see between events and how you try to understand people and events. That's, every writer is different about that. That's why we have so many books about George Washington. There's one back there. I'd like to recommend a book that made a big impact on me when I was a teenager. And that was um, Friendly Persuasion by Jessamine West that was made into a movie with Gary Cooper and Tony Perkins. And it takes the story of a Quaker family during the Civil War that was conflicted about whether they should support the freeing of slaves when it went against their principles of nonviolence. Tony Perkins left his family and joined the war. And the scenes where he was on the battle line made such an impression on me that war is not just all rah-rah, but an individual having to find these decisions within him, very powerful. I don't know if the movie is available, but the book certainly is. Well, I'm a fan of Turner Classic Movies. I'm sure they show it. Um, so I, I, I will look for it. I've, I have not seen it, nor have I read the book. So, Yes, sir. You've shared with us the uh, survivors of Gettysburg's and Verdun's and Ardennes, new battlefields, movie theaters, and dance halls, and schoolrooms. How will the survivors of those horror shows Fair. I'm not sure I follow the question. I apologize. The violence that witnesses to battles oh. suffer PTSD. Will we see the same results with the survivors of the battles in 
school rooms and theaters yeah. and supermarkets and so on. Yeah, um, I, I'm not an expert who will uh, be able to be authoritative on this subject. Um, I do think the violence in our culture has reached a really dangerous point. I forget which shooting it was, but some woman passing by some mass shooting was overcome because she had been present at a mass shooting two or three years before, and it felt like they were following her. Now, it's impossible that these people do not have some form of PTSD, maybe mild, it may be acute, I don't know. Um, and, you know, we, we're really irresponsible about this. And I'm not going to stand here and give you an answer, but it's, it's impossible that we are not doing more to try to control that. Here, here, let's wait. Here. No, sorry. During the war, did the leadership, i.e., generals and colonels, have an awareness of the suffering of their troops and any means or any kind of writings that reflected that? You know, that hasn't been something I've studied, but of course they had to. You couldn't not know it. They'd see it in camp. Um, you know, there's a the famous. Uh, seen at the end of Pickett's charge when the Virginia troops are streaming back to the Confederate lines having failed. And General Lee runs out and says, it's my fault. It's my fault. I'm sorry. Um, he knew what he had done and what, what the consequences were for other people. And, and you know, that's a tremendous burden. It's one thing to sacrifice yourself. It's another thing to sacrifice other people. So, yeah, I I have no doubt that they understood that. They, you know, commanders have to steel themselves against that. You know, there was I don't mean to be flip, but there there was a reason Ulysses Grant drank. Um, it wasn't just that he had a weakness for liquor. He had a lot on his conscience, and I think. It, it's it's always going to be difficult. You mentioned a minute ago uh, the epidemic of violence in this country, and I think we have uh, basically ignored our mental health problems for 50 years. So my question is, in your research and your writing, do you find some people who uh, survive uh, combat more healthy than others? It's because they might lack empathy for the suffering of others or have some issues such as that? Yeah, I, I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, it's, and, and this would be current research, would be, you know, and the focus is on those who are suffering, not those who are doing okay. So I don't think people are asking that very good question. Well, okay, you've been through something terrible and you seem to be functioning. How did that happen? You know, one of the things I've been struck by is reading about, we're losing all our World War II veterans. They're, they're reaching their sell-by date. And many of the next generation below have said, dad couldn't talk about it until the last couple of years. He wouldn't talk about it. And there was something about coming near the end of their life and needing to share that experience to get it out. Um, but also um, the unwillingness to focus on it. And for many, I think not talking about it may have been the right answer. Um, and it's, it's hard to just say, well, those are the ones 
who are just killers. Um, I read a study of militaries, comparative militaries once that said, the Germans are always the best units. They, they, they always co you know, coordinate best, they're best organized. They, they, they just really approach war intelligently and effectively. Um, and there was something about the British and they said about the Americans, well, the Americans are a mess, but one in a hundred is a real killer. And that stuck with me. You know, is that Alvin York? Is that, you know, who was actually a pacifist who had to be persuaded to go into uh, Sergeant York, to, to go into combat. Um, I do think it is an unusual ability uh, to be able to survive all of what certainly modern war, wars since they became so terrible. And it would be very interesting to know more about it. Well, and if, if there isn't, um, I just want to tell you that my terrier jock thinks it's a great book. Uh -huh.